Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanya Burkhart, and I'm a member of Peel Acorn. Did everyone freeze for you or is it just me? Lost audio. Yes. No, Steph, it froze for me, but it's you, you're back and I can hear you okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. So. The question is that it's freeze for Jacob. Jacob's frozen in her, <laughs> in his little uh, TV box. Yes. <gasps> yes. He's gone. He's gone. Hey. Isn't technology fun, everybody? Yes. <laughs> um, well, Andrew, where did, yes, you just keep, yes, the opportunity for you to speak keeps popping in here, right? Um, I don't even know. I think she logged off. I think she logged off. Maybe she's trying to. Can someone phone her? Yes, I can phone her. Um, Andrew, why don't you start? And then I will work out. Um, your presentation is about 10 minutes long, 15 minutes long. Oh, uh, I have PowerPoint if you could make me co-host. And yes, I finished it at 629. Um, I'm pretty sure it'll be 10 minutes. Okay, I love it. So I'll make you co-host and then um, we can work out what's happening. Okay, there you go. You share your screen and I will phone Acorn. So uh, because of how Zoom works, I, I can't tell if it's up. Is it up? No, your PowerPoint is not up yet. There it is. Now it's coming up. Ta-da. There you go. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having invited me to, to present. Um, this basically, um, is a reworking for efficiency of our position paper uh, and the, uh, the petition that we are inviting people to sign. Um, so I will try not to speak to every point on the slides. I, people can read um, and I find it horrifying when people read their slides to, to their colleagues. Um, so we are the Headwaters Institute uh, we changed our letters patent to do full watershed management in 2018. We kept the name because we had an identity uh, and we wanted to keep that. Um, and so we're, we get into land use planning and uh, the Great Lakes uh, Water Quality, uh, the Great Lakes, the Water Quality Protection Act and so on and so forth. Lake Simcoe land use planning. I want to start out by saying that week in politics can be a really long time. Um, I mean, it was just on the 25th of October that Bill 23 was tabled. Um, and uh, we crafted our position and our paper, which came out the next weekend um, uh, on the bill. And um, the number of regulatory proposals on the Environmental Registry of Ontario, the ERO. Um, and so we're gonna to speak to those and that led us to a position a bit more uh, succinct than other NGOs that seem to think they can change 12 or 24 of the particular aspects of 10 acts and 13 postings on the Environmental Registry and and, and put lipstick on a pig. Uh, we believe that everything associated with Bill 23 must be withdrawn 
and we consider the totality of what the government has tried to do here is in fact far worse than using the notwithstanding clause against the, um, the, the, uh, the education workers. Um, one of the things that happened in the last week is that just last Friday, on top of what they'd already done, uh, the province announced their desire to do land swaps in the green belt, and they started uh, tabling their responses to official plans. So we're gonna we're gonna touch on those very briefly. So for those of you who aren't policy wonks and don't like to read till one in the morning by candlelight, uh, Bill 23 is another one of those despised omnibus bills. It's 175 pages long and it amends 10 acts. So the government is proceeding with undue haste. Uh, they, uh, they invoked closure on second reading, kicked it to a standing committee. There's no public consultations. The First Nations are outraged that they have been once again precluded from participating. And the government's intent is to pass it as soon as possible. Some of the key changes lean toward, and that's important wording, because it is somewhat hard to decipher um, from the watery themes in some of the documents what they're really going to do. I will also share with the audience that in the past, the government has made significant changes to bills on third reading. And those changes have never been shared with anybody. And they haven't been subject to anybody's comment whatsoever. So what they're leaning to may be really hard to decipher, but they're removing upper tier planning coordination so that communities will compete with each other. And I don't know how many of you remember, but a good example of that is the Pine Valley Road in Vaughan. Uh, Vaughan section four, I think it was, won a planning award in North America because it was such a marvelous document. They forgot to connect the roads because it was outside of block Four. And so then they had a huge debate about should we uh, put the road through corporate conservation area. So you get planning chaos without upper tier uh, coordination. They're removing requirements for public meetings and even public notice of development proposals. There's weak provisions for affordable housing. Phil Pothin goes into that in great detail, as do some of our other sister organizations reduces legal recourse to the Ontario Land Tribunal and prohibits green development standards. Like, no, you can't be progressive. <laughs> so the title of this page is really purposefully redundant because the democracy is short sheeted in the bill. And then there's the draconian misplanning elements uh, that, that preclude public meetings and public notice. And then you can't have access to to tribunals. So democracy and legal norms are subverted by this process. Um, a, a second part, why is my screen jumping around? Let's do this gently, Andrew. Oh my goodness, stop it. Behave. Um, conservation has also got it. I didn't say conservation authorities because it's actually bigger than that. Um, people can't read if there's a block on the page. Uh, my, I'm going to blame Stephanie. Why not? It's all her fault. Um, development will be allowed on wetlands and in floodplains. Um, this is a really interesting one that's really hidden in some of the regs. There'll be no longer a requirement for a simulative capacity assessments for flows coming from sewage treatment plants. This is really big in air in Ontario, where they're putting in a new STP for an extra 10,000 people. And they're probably gonna have um, effluent that will exceed the temperature of brook trout, killing all the brook trout in the upper credit, the upper west credit. Um, they've removed the mandate of conservation authorities to consider the conservation of land and pollution. I said I would read this. Um, a really big one is that in a previous change to the Conservation Authorities Act, they withdrew, they, they chastised, they, they restricted the ability of the authorities to work with municipalities. So the CAs did workarounds because they provide services to municipalities. And there was two years of negotiation to amend section 28 of the Conservation Authorities Act. 
and they were able to get uh, allow the CAs to enter into service agreements with the municipalities. And, and now the, this, this dictatorial autocratic government has decided, no, 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 you can't even do that. We won't even let the municipalities enter into voluntary agreements with you to perform these important watershed management services. We don't want watershed management services. We just want development. Um, and as you may know there, uh, the, the, the CAs will be required to produce an inventory for lands that could contain housing, and we're going to lose the CA monitoring and report card process. Let's see if we can change screens. In addition to all those regulatory aberrations, um, there's actually been four years of, of environmental subterfuge by this government. Um, they keep saying they're protecting the environment, and they keep not doing it. Um, we, they often refer to the Made in Ontario Environment Plan. It does not exist. It's a draft document for cabinet. There's no decision notice. It has no status whatsoever other than as a propaganda mechanism. Uh, the wetland strategy has been archived on the government website for four years, even though they're now bringing in wetland offsetting um, and so on and so forth. And up until Friday, there was no action on growing the size of the green belts, nor on adding the Paris Gulf Moraine, which I'll get into in a minute because I'm going to continue to try to meet my 10 minute promise. Um, a whole class of people has also been slandered by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Um, he has announced falsely that we've gone beyond being nimbyists, not sure who they are, and that we've now adopted banana. I've never heard of banana. I've never heard anybody say banana, um, but this is misinformation and uh, insulting to those who wish to engage in civil society. Um, so I've been very clear and it's in our petition. We are not nimbyists. We do not express concerns because we're massive secret landholders. Um, but, but because we think water courses and wetlands are part of the global commons, because society needs to protect regional biodiversity and food security, and because it's imperative to build sustainable low carbon communities in an age of the climate crisis, which this government doesn't believe in, biodiversity, which this government can't sell, and the food security crisis, which they just don't understand. Breaking news. On Friday, the government announced that in keeping with their plan to put expressways through the heart of the Greenbelt, they're now gonna do land swaps around the edges. It's kind of like Pac-Man, one's going right down the middle of the Greenbelt and then all these little Pac-Men on the sides. Um, and they're, they're talking about removing 7,400 hectares or acres, I can't remember, it's too late, I haven't had dinner, um, and adding a part of, um, the proposed Paris Gulf Moraine and urban river valleys. The urban river valleys are already protected. You can't build there. So they're not adding 9,400 acres and taking out 7,400. Um, they're gonna take out 7,400 and, and add 2,000. And I talked today to the Greenbelt West Coalition and they're horrified. They figure they're getting just over 1.5% of what they asked for, which was a comprehensive plan for the Greenbelt and um, protected countryside, uh, and they're just getting, um, they're getting a postage stamp. And then finally, there's this uh, important thread four. <laughs> oh, here we go with jumping screens again. Sorry, folks, I was talking about technology. The second thread four uh, was reminded to me uh, last night by, by Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, not only is all this going on, but the government's starting to issue their formally approved new official plans for municipalities. Um, and where there were these huge constructive debates for years in communities, Hamilton uh, and, and Waterloo and Halton in particular opted for um, density and very little uh, urban boundary expansion and this province has decreed like 5,000 acres for Halton shall be built on. Um, so they are completely um, seeking to ensure return on investment for land speculators uh, and to push sprawl and 
uh, and, and a carbon intensive way of living. So it's, this is my conclusion. I'm going to say that the 10 minutes has forced me to be more aggressive than I usually am, but that's probably not true. Um, Bill 23 is an effort to remake Ontario as an autocracy, pushing urban development while sacrificing the environment and democracy. We do not believe that fighting over the 750 changes in all of these things is going to be successful. And if we won half of them, it wouldn't matter because this government would be back the next week changing them anyways. We believe very strongly that everything should be withdrawn. And as I said earlier, this is really worse than the notwithstanding clause. It's more nefarious, it's more cynical because they haven't done it with the same degree of public profile where they were forced to withdraw. This is all within their power under our system of government and they're just wielding a club. The, uh, it's really sad that in these days and age, when COP27 is going on in Egypt, that we have a Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing who does not understand sustainable planning and uses the environment, the economy as a cudgel against the interdependency of the economy, the environment and democracy. I wasn't timing myself. I, I hope I haven't gone over. Thank you so very much. That's great, Andrew. Um, so I'm not, I haven't been following the chat window yet, but does anyone have any questions for Andrew? Anyone want to raise their hand or um, just got where like I said, we're very informal. Is there anything that you want to ask or for clarification? Wow. Is it a shy group? Uh, so someone mentioned, Paul mentioned he doesn't understand the removing of green building standards. Um, just letting you know, Andrew, we do we did cover that at the Friday meeting that is in our Friday event. Um, uh, counselor or now, I guess, maybe form. No, nah, I guess he's counselor now for the next couple of days um, in Waterloo. Jeff Henry to talk about uh, urban the planning process, as well as green development standard. Well, he talked about site control plan and Gabby. Uh, Calabos from Green Develop or some Clean Air Partnerships did talk about green development standards. So they do have access to additional information. But for the people here, um, uh, for the people here, could you just briefly in one or two minutes say what green development standards are? Um, give you a bit of history and the, the paradigm, if you will. The city of Toronto created uh, green development standards when Jennifer Kiesmet was its chief planner. And it's to try to encourage density. Uh, it's uh, increased density around transit stations. Um, and it's also ensuring uh, energy efficiency for uh, windows and heating elements to reduce greenhouse gases. It's part of an overall process to also green the building stock with uh, subsidies for new cladding, for better insulation, and so on and so on and so forth. Toronto's a big city, it's got a big budget, but the green development standards are starting to appeal to smaller municipalities. And, and so there's this effort in smaller municipalities, particularly in, in uh, Georgetown, uh, where they're trying to redevelop along green development standard principles. And so the government saw a huge threat in that density um, and they've outlawed, they've banned the principle of a community seeking to walk lightly on the face of the earth beyond imagination. So if you don't have them, you can't get them. And it, there's some, it's all very uncertain, but the question is whether or not the city of Toronto will be forced to avoid theirs. It ain't fun folks. Yeah, absolutely. And green development standards are things such as um, it's ensuring that new developments have a stronger regulations or or standards. So expecting because the Ontario Building Code is very light on green green development um, and anything to do with uh, climate em like emissions, the reduction of emissions, um, green development standards allow municipalities to decide that they would like to have. Um, net zero housing, or they would like to decide 
some other type of development. They can also then regulate, say, topsoil depth for trees in the area. So the trees will actually survive after five years because the topsoil depth, depth is less than four inches, which is, I think, typically of, of areas. Um, it also, green development standards allows you to take a whole, some comprehensive look of a development site and how it relates to the betterment of that community by expecting developers to build better. And I guess from Ford yes. government's perspective is that um, that slows down development, you know, putting these expectations on these developers slow it down. Therefore, it shouldn't be allowed. And that's part of the site control plan being removed. I'm assuming it, again, I am just a person following all this information. Please uh, clarify or if I've stated anything wrong. No, nothing wrong. Kevin, you want to weigh in? No, you've raised so many good points here and so many concerns. Uh, you know, I think we need to uh, try to do what we can against all of them, really. It doesn't matter whether it's a green development standards or some of the uh, other undemocratic things that are being taken away. It's uh, it's all quite concerning. Yes, and so the question was, will this nullify transform TO? So green development standards, you'll watch this from Gabby, amazing clean air partnerships. I condensed her presentation down to about 10 minutes, I think. Um, but she made a very clear point that municipalities are trying to reach their climate, their climate emission goals, um, trying to reach 50 by 30. And green development standards was one of the major ways of municipalities to be able to do this so that they can be, yeah, just one of the major ways. Uh, and there's like eight or nine different municipalities or regions within Ontario that have implemented their own green development standards because they didn't believe the Ontario Building Code would help them reach their climate emission goals. So what this does is it basically says, okay, um, all the developers in those in those regions or, or municipalities who've already been developing and planning to develop better, sorry, that's been scrapped. Now you can go back to... Um, and from my understanding is that uh, from Gabby, that there is some ways of changing some policies and bylaws and, and doing that um, in each municipality now to kind of catch some of the pieces that might be broken um, through removing the availability to do green air, green infrastructure, or sorry, be able to do um, green development standards. But that's going to take time individually for those municipalities to better understand what those are and to implement them. Okay, so I think Ta uh, Tanya's here. And so, um, yeah, so let's move on to Tanya. Jacob has become- You're muted tired. if you're if you're talking. Cool. Thank you all. I've put the uh, link to our um, petition in the chat. Um, we have never had more than 120 before. We're over 600. And I'm suddenly dancing in my head is the prospect of a thousand. Please share the link to the petition with your networks. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. And this document will be in our open sourced uh, folder, uh, Google Drive folder that we have. Um, and hopefully we can get some place to put it on a website. But again, there is three or four. Acorn has another letter for people to sign. And if we can get people en masse to sign, you know, four or five of those letters at a time, then, you know, getting a thousand people shouldn't be that big of an issue, right? So, Tanya, we're just waiting for you to. I know you're here. I'm here. Okay, great. Okay. And you're good with sharing your presentation? Yes. Okay. Well, actually, I'm not sure how to do it on your screen. Um, it pops up as soon as you can pop up yours. I just don't know how to do that. Um, so if you go to the very bottom and you click yep. share screen, and then you find the window that you want to share, and then you click share. I don't have a copy of that accessible to me. Um, okay, so I'm, I don't need to share it. Uh, that's I okay. Can I can share it. it. Okay. Kakuma uh, sent me. I just don't um, have that file open. Uh, Steph, I'm still a co host. Is that preventing anybody from signing in? Uh, nope. Uh, we can bump you off co host so you don't get the 
annoying um, little pop-ups on your windows of. Uh, I'm just going to speak without the presentation. I don't really need it. It's okay. Yeah, I, you know what? I can um, share it. I, I, I um, Acorn, uh, Boomika sent it to me as well. So I yeah. will share my screen. Oops, that's not what you want to see. Da, da, oops, I have to clip that out. Oh, sorry. Okay, there you go. Okay, so um, my name is Tammy Burkhart, and I'm a member of Peel Acorn. And um, Acorn Canada is uh, protesting and asking uh, Doug Ford and his government to scrap Bill 23. Um, we're a community organization of low and moderate income people, and our base believes that um, it's not economically just for tenants. Um, a little bit about our organization, ACORN stands for um, Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now. Um, we're a community union and members decide what actions uh, we want to uh, uh, have and uh, what kind of justice we're looking for in our community. And so, um, I just want to go to the next slide, please. Um, Bill 23 is more homes built faster. And um, who is he building these houses for? It's kind of our question. And um, he announced it on October 25th, 2022, which is um, really short notice uh, for people and organizations. And he wants to build 1.5 million homes. He's referred this to the Standing Committee on Heritage, Infrastructure and Cultural Policy, which is kind of um, an odd committee. And hearings are happening in person in Markham, Brampton, and Toronto. Uh, Toronto has in-person hearings, and it's extremely uh, limited information to the public on hearings, and um, it's a limited window to apply. So we really think that that's kind of um, an undemocratic thing to do, to kind of ram this through government. And we believe that the bill takes away the power and money uh, cities can use to build and protect affordable housing. Um, it has to do a lot with inclusionary zoning. So inclusionary zoning is funding that developers get uh, from the province uh, to build in uh, major transit station areas or MTSAs. And they have to build a certain percentage um, of affordable housing uh, within these new developments. And so um, Doug Ford has already restricted uh, these powers by saying IZ can only be um, effective or used in um, MTSAs. And so um, taking this legislation and um, taking away the percentages from municipalities, um, Toronto has passed theirs. Um, their IZ percentage for affordable housing is 16 to 22%. And Doug Ford wants 5%. Mississauga, uh, we worked for a year and we got anywhere between five and 10% uh, in Mississauga. And so all the work done by communities um, to get affordable housing is going to be um, kind of overridden by this Bill, 20, um, Bill 23. And so um, Doug Ford also wants to make uh, the affordability term 25 years. That means at the end of 25 years, uh, the unit uh, will be uh, go back to market value. And so that affordable housing that he's looking to build is simply going to disappear after 25 years. And that's not just. Um, it just makes a revolving door for affordable housing. And so in Mississauga and Toronto, um, Acorn has fought and got the affordability terms at perpetuity. And so all of the work that we've done to make a affordable housing forever, um, he's going to strip and turn back to 25 years. Um, Bill 23 also kind of affects uh, rental replacement uh, bylaws. And so municipalities like Toronto and Mississauga, um, they have bylaws that protect tenants' rights in terms of um, rent eviction, uh, demolition, and units um, that are being turned into condos. And Bill 23 is going to um, override these bylaws. Um, it's looking to address aging uh, energy efficiencies in rental housing stock. 
And it's just gonna turn those units into revolving doors. And so no energy efficiency is really going to be achieved. And so um, green efficient housing um, isn't likely to be um, mandated. And we can't meet uh, carbon emission targets um, at the expense of low income affordability. And to do this, the province has to um, have online consultations uh, to standardize municipal bylaws. And so he's looking to take our bylaws and our planning departments, and he's looking to override all of that. He's claiming to build 1.5 million homes. And who's he building them for? You've asked that question at the beginning. Housing in the hands of wealthy developers. And the cities uh, will bridge these, these affordability um, deficits in terms of developers paying uh, fees for roads, sewers, water, and hydro. And taxpayers will more than likely be stuck with these bills. And it gives developers uh, basically a free hand to develop how they want and not in, not in terms of affordable housing or environmentally uh, sound housing. And so the, um, the, the hit to affordable housing and the environment, it kind of goes hand in hand. And um, ACOR members are speaking um, at the um, committee, I believe on Thursday in uh, Brampton and Markham. And so um, we've also posted an online link to a petition and a letter that goes to Doug Ford and it will go to Doug Ford uh, by your postal code. And so it will send a letter to Steve Clark and your MPP. And so um, there's a link uh, for that online action. So I'm just gonna turn it back to Steph. And uh, that's our presentation for the make one. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know this is like, that's a huge, overwhelming topic. And, and I think, um, yeah, I, just in terms of uh, social justice and just anyone, I think anyone would expect that 80% market rate would be pretty much unaffordable for most people. Um, so I, you know, this is not only targeting, this bill is not only targeting people who are on affordable housing right now, but um, something that it'll target so many other people that are currently in dire situations regarding being able to have enough money to pay for any rent. So that's just, if people want to put their hands up, if anyone wants to just do a shout out. Um, yeah, just if you want to ask Tanya any questions. Anyone? Okay, so we're going to have breakout rooms later on. So if people want to learn more about this, we can chat about that during those breakout rooms. Uh, so we're going to have the next speaker. All right, Tanya, do you have anything to say before we move on to the next speaker? Uh, no, just if you can please uh, post the link in the chat yes, uh, I will. for um, the letters and uh, people can just uh, cut and paste that link and uh, send a letter. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so the next, um, Millie, are you here from Ontario Climate Emergency Coalition? Yes, I'm here. I just, okay, great. just getting uh, set up here. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Sorry, it's 10 minutes. You're 10 minutes. I'm, I'm putting you 10 minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just joined. So I was just getting set up. But uh, all good. I'm here. Okay. Um, and then after this, and your million your presentation is about 15 minutes. Um, after that, we're going to do our uh, breakout rooms where people can talk, break out into different issues and topics and start discussing how it relates to them. Having someone in that room that can take notes is extremely important. We wanna hear from people in those rooms uh, discussing what does this topic mean to them? How do we rally more people in the community around these topics and issues that you're gonna be talking about in your breakout room? Who are the missing people that should be engaged? Um, who is the different demographics? 
Um, and then after 15 minutes, we're going to come back and hear from the different groups so that we can build a larger momentum and fully understanding how does the different pieces of Bill 23 impact just about everyone in our community. And then discuss again, how do we how do we reach the general public so that the conservative government just doesn't say, oh, it's those people, it's the environmental people, it's the affordable housing people, um, whatever they, you know, they they rally and speak up all the time and they're just kind of over there. We want to get en masse a large amount of people informed. Okay, Millie, so it's your, your time to talk now. Great. Okay, I'll just start then by sharing my screen if that's okay. I have to make you a sorry. Oh, you did. Barb did it. Great job. Okay, perfect. Then I'll just start this, uh, I guess, as a slideshow here. Okay, can everybody see my uh, my screen? Yes. All good? Okay, perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, for asking me to to participate in this amazing session. It was very short notice, so this is kind of thrown together. My apologies. Um, so I am uh, Millie Roy, and as you heard, I'm the one of the co-chairs of the Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign and OCEC. We've uh, um, sort of uh, put together a large scale um, call to action to try to mobilize a response. And I'm also the chair of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. So I'll be speaking to you about the health impacts of, of Bill 23, and there are many. Um, so we know that judicious land use planning is, is very important, um, essential really to public health, but also to the economy, to housing, uh, supply and affordability, equity, food security, and of course, to the escalating climate crisis that sort of binds all of this together. And the, the window to to, uh, to implement fundamentally um, you know, necessary and effective climate action is quickly closing, but certainly it is not closed. And that's why we're all here today. Um, but of course, we all recognize that good governance is more critical than ever before. Um, and, uh, and we want to, uh, to hold the government uh, accountable. Um, <clears throat> Now, in, in land use planning for sustainable uh, population growth, we want to avoid sprawl, we want to optimize well planned densification, and this is critical in order to avoid the environmental harms, which in turn cause significant human health as well as economic harms. Um, and in, in Ontario, of course, the conservation authorities, the protected green belt land, and the municipal green standards were all part of, of this plan, and these are all threatened by Bill 20. So what I tried to do is to break down some of the impacts of the obvious sprawl that would result should this, this uh, bill come to fruition and the loss of municipal green standards. And then we'll break down each of these topics um, in, in terms of how they impact health. So we know we can anticipate uh, an increase in car dependent lifestyles. We know this would create a smaller supply of larger sized, more expensive and more isolated housing units compared with properly planned sustainable sort of densification type of an approach. We know that this will cause massive destruction of wetlands, green spaces and farmland. It's going to escalate greenhouse gas emissions, which, of course, fuel the climate crisis, and it will escalate air pollution. So let's look at each of these in turn. Um, when it comes to car dependent lifestyles, a lot of, of research already shows the sort of if you build it, they will come phenomenon. The more we build road and highway infrastructure, the more and of course, these will be needed to access the sprawl housing, the more uh, we get um, vehicular traffic and car use uh, amplified. And this in turn reduces physical activity. It has a negative impact on mental health. It increases obesity diabetes, heart and lung disease. It leads to increased motor vehicle accidents. And again, we know that it leads to increased fossil fuel uh, burning uh, and air pollution. And we'll talk about those health impacts uh, in just a few moments. What about the, the type of housing and, and the, the reduced number of housing units that, that will be produced? Well, we certainly know that this would worsen the current crisis of housing supply affordability and the inequity. Um, and, and 
access to decent housing is an important component of, of human uh, health uh, as, as a social determinant of health. Um, and again, the amplification in fossil fuel use, which will occur through the transportation and accessing these homes, as well as heating and cooling a larger home compared with a smaller home. Uh, and again, the, the impacts uh, of amplifying air pollution. Um, the fact that these homes are more isolated has negative mental health impacts compared with living in, in um, surroundings that are more socially connected to our fellow human beings. And we also know that this type of, of housing in particular with sprawl developments, that many powerful health and climate solutions become impossible. And these include things such as public transit, active transport, so walking and cycling infrastructure, um, and district energy systems, which help to connect energy between buildings to reduce energy demands and reduce emissions. And all of these are really powerful solutions which require a certain density of people to be living in a certain area, which does not occur with, with sprawl housing. What about the destruction of our land? Um, this destroys natural carbon sinks, which of course will worsen the climate uh, crisis. It increases the risk of overland flooding, which has its own health impacts. It increases he what's called heat islands. And we'll talk about the impacts of heat uh, in just a moment. And it reduces, of course, agricultural output by consuming our precious farmland. This leads to food insecurity, problems with food affordability, increasing food bank dependency, and we're seeing record high levels of use currently. And of course, these have negative impacts on nutrition and our health. And again, there are negative mental health impacts when humans have reduced access to nature. And this is proven by science. Um, in fact, at Cape, we have an entire uh, program called the Parks Rx program, which is founded on, on the, the science and evidence that shows us that access to nature can improve everything, not only mental health, but uh, birth weight in, in babies, um, seniors' uh, health, um, ADHD sufferers, uh, school performance in children. So all of these things are tied in to having access to nature. Um, let's move to the next um, fallout from, um, from this bill, which is air pollution. We already know that 99% of the world's population lives in, in areas where air quality guidelines are not met. Here in Canada, we're certainly relatively luckier than some other parts of the world, but there is still a major problem and it's about to be made worse. Just to put it in perspective, air pollution is the fourth largest risk factor in the world for death and illness and is behind only sort of diets of what we eat, what we smoke and high blood pressure. And next in line is what we breathe. Um, and 12% of all deaths in the world are due to air pollution. So if we look at the Canadian context, um, already over 15,000 Canadians die prematurely every year due to air pollution. And the economic impact of this is $114 billion. If we look at, if we narrow this down to Ontario, nearly 7,000 Ontarians are dying prematurely. Let's get down to specifics here. And, um, and the economic impact of that is $49 billion. So we can also see that when it comes to the economic impact, nearly half of the national impact, which we said was $114 billion, nearly half of that impact is falling on Ontario. So you know, we, a, a government cannot ignore the, these economic impacts as well tied in with climate and health. Um, and let's just have a quick look at how air pollution actually impacts our health. You know, why does this death and illness occur? So, of course, the lung is the obvious uh, target uh, to begin with. Um, so breathing in these pollutants causes things like asthma, emphysema, bronchitis and allergies. But in fact, once we breathe them in, these particles actually are absorbed into our bloodstream and our bodies and begin to impact many other body systems. So for instance, our heart and vascular system, um, exposure to air pollution causes high blood pressure, heart attacks, heart arrhythmias. In fact, some new research just showed that healthy teenagers with just two hours of air pollution exposure actually begin to show signs of irregular heartbeat. 
Um, there are neurologic impacts, so dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ADHD, and many others. There are definite links with cancer. So diesel, for instance, is a known carcinogen. It particularly is linked to lung cancer, but also leukemias and breast cancers arise from air pollution exposure as well. Um, these pollutants affect our endocrine system. So diabetes and obesity is directly caused by air pollution, not just sort of a bystander effect from, from being sedentary, but because these particles are actually uh, interfering with our body's abil ability to handle sugar, to metabolize, and so on. Um, there are risks to pregnant women who are exposed uh, in terms of low birth weight, premature birth, stillbirth, and birth defects. And finally, there's new research showing um, risks to with COVID-19. So air pollution exposure increases the risk of getting uh, infected by COVID, of transmitting it, and the risk of dying. Um, and it's felt that the air pollution particles actually serve as almost a little vector. The, the uh, COVID-19 virus can literally sort of hitch a ride with the pollution particles and enter our, our bodies. And respiratory systems, lungs that are chronically breathed polluted air are inflamed and more vulnerable to begin with and, and therefore more likely to get infected. And that was just a short list of, you know, of, of the impacts. Um, and then finally, we'll turn to our last impact, which is the climate crisis. And, and we know that this bill, you know, will, will exacerbate um, emissions and, and lead to uh, a worsening of the climate crisis. And the first point to make here is that the climate crisis today is the single greatest human health crisis of our time full stop. And that's according to the World Health Organization, the United Nations, Canadian Public Health Association, uh, and, and so on, you name it. Um, and how does climate change and climate crisis affect our health? There's a multiple um, uh, sort of different mechanisms um, that are sort of nicely displayed in, in this little poster from the Canadian Medical Association. But if we sort of work our way through it, um, first and foremost is the actual impact of heat on the human body. The BC heat dome that occurred um, uh, in 2021 killed over 800 people. And it goes down in Canadian history as the deadliest um, uh, weather related event that has ever occurred in Canada. And it was just simple heat. Um, there are multiple infectious diseases that are on the rise. So many of them are tick-borne. So things like Lyme disease, West Nile, but many others as well. Um, there's just the direct impact of illness and death from things like uh, flooding, extreme wind, drought, and wildfires. Um, and the fact that air pollution is further escalated with wildfires, which in turn are driven by climate change. So there's so many interconnections here. Um, there's also the fact that climate uh, change in itself is lowering the ability of our land to produce food. And that's going to be compounded with a bill like this, which is also reducing the amount of land we have available. And all of that leads to further food insecurity and poor nutrition. And finally, um, the uh, climate crisis also has major impacts on, on mental health as well. So um, I'm just going to wrap it up now. I didn't want to leave you, though, with all of those sort of, you know, doom and gloom facts and figures. That's the truth. We need to confront it. But what I hope is that we can use that to be energized, you know, to realize what's at stake and turn our energy, you know, to, um, you know, to fighting and, and opposing things such as Bill 23 that have so much potential harm. Um, so Bill 23 is the opposite of a solution. Um, the massive economic costs of, of failing to incorporate climate action as, you know, as we grow our cities and as we do have to, you know, use our land. And uh, it must be done properly. And the, the failures will fall on municipalities and ultimately on the taxpayer. And just as an example, um, you know, multiple um, economists have worked out the fact that, for instance, putting a price on pollution um, actually pays off many, many times over based on just the healthcare cost savings alone. So, you know, if a government is saying like, you know, this is too expensive, in, in point of fact, no, it's not. It is so much more expensive not, you know, to, to take the proper action. Um, 
And this is my final sort of image here, which is courtesy of our friends at Chase, the Canadian Health Association for Sustainability and, uh, and Equity. And this is what sustainability can look like. This is an example of the idea of, of the 15 minute neighborhood where we achieve density of housing, but planned green spaces that make it a beautiful, you know, wonderful place to live, um, where we have sustainable mobility, so cycling, um, walking, public transit, that links us to everything we need, retail, commercial, health, um, our public services, education, and so on. And I think that it's important, you know, for, for us to, to realize as well that these solutions do not have to be ultimate sacrifices. The, you know, these, when we plan properly, design properly, we can live sustainably um, in healthy, thriving, vibrant, and, and, sort of, and socially connected uh, self-contained communities where we work and we shop and we eat and play, but in a way that is uh, living within the capacity of, of the earth. And I'll leave you with one final quote that you can uh, read for yourselves. Very good, and I will stop sharing. Thanks, Millie. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Millie before we go into uh, talk more about strategy? Anything anyone wants to clarify, you can raise your hand and put in the chat window. I find that these events, it's it's really interesting because I I think there's so many people here that are eager and um, excited about moving forward and they want to learn more and they just, but I find I think these topics are so overwhelming that the processing people's brains need to take during this time of hearing people speak, um, you know, it, it, it creates this kind of, um, uh, you know, crickets. <laughs> <laughs> but normally people, you'd have so many people engaged in your topic, right? Um, but thank you, Millie, for, for presenting. Do you have anything else you want to say before we kind of wrap up? For myself, I think only that you know, I hope that this will give people um, some of the facts and, and understanding they need to say, you know what, this impacts everybody and that, you know, all of these problems are intertwined, but as a result, the solutions are intertwined as well. And I think that's where there's a lot of power and a lot of hope. Yeah. So maybe that's a good question for Millie, Andrew and Tanya. You know, how do you see these three topics um, and other topics creating a larger over, overarching strategy um, to fight not only Bill 23, but, you know, the greater issue and problem of what the Ford government's doing? Millie, you want to jump in? You kind of mentioned it touched <laughs> sure. very briefly. Sure. I think that's one of the reasons that I mentioned money and the economy and economic impact so many times is that, you know, traditionally conservative governments always try to sell their policies, you know, saying, look, you know, we're doing what's fiscally responsible and that's what conservative governments do, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that, you know, people need to understand um, that fiscal responsibility and fiscal sustainability can only be achieved going forward, um, you know, within the framework of, of climate and environmental sustainability. And, and obviously health, you know, falls along with that as well. Um, and, and, you know, this has been shown many, many times by people who study these problems. Um, and I think that messaging gets needs to get out to the wider, you know, public and, and of course, to, to our policymakers. Absolutely. Andrew, do you have um, anything you want to um, mention about an overarching how do we mobilize um, past the issue of conservation authorities and wetlands and move into a whole bigger momentum or movement? Well, I don't think we can underestimate the value of the communities, plural, that are getting their legs under them on this, these issues. What's going on behind the scenes? as well as the public positions. The Association of Municipalities of Ontario has called for a pause. And that's diplomatic speaking for, we don't like this, it needs to go back to the drawing board. Uh, obviously the CAs are pushing, individual municipalities are pushing. Um, First Nations, um, I'm told, 
are about to become more involved. Currently, there's really only been a couple of statements from individual uh, chiefs, uh, and they're um, there's there's they're going to be gathering. the The environmental groups are a, a, a spearhead to this, uh, and we don't need to take a back seat because of our size, but. Um, so what we need to do is hope that the bigger organizations, not the little guys like the Ontario Headwaters Institute, can play with the bigger, the bigger organizations, labor, AMO, CAs, and, um, and uh, First Nations. But this is, make no mistake, this is all about a certain perspective about money. Doug Ford even today stated that, oh, I'm taking all those, those river, those uh, 15 excerpts of 77,000 acres out of the Greenbelt because we're, we're gonna have immigrants. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's abs he, he hasn't responded to the federal government's climate change papers by saying, oh, we have to do our part. No, he sued them. But he's he's shamelessly using immigration as a as a as a wedge and to say, oh, we're gonna have to take parts of the green belt. This is about not Millie's sustainable economy. This is about trickle-down economics by the chosen few. And I am an I am a capitalist, I run a business, and this is this is irresponsible and unacceptable and must be opposed in its entirety. Thank you so much. Uh, Tanya, I, I know that you kind of got thrown in this the last very shortly. Do you feel that ACORN has a, a stance on, or are you feel comfortable enough um, speaking about the stance of ACORN and how affordability isn't just something that should only be looked at for Bill 23 in the affordable bill, affordability lens for CART because of the cuts to affordable housing percentages and the development fees. But do you, do you guys have a bigger stance of how it fits within the greater realm of everything that Bill 23 is doing? I think Bill 23, it's, it's not just about um, housing, it's about the land that he's gonna take. And um, it's, it's not, a good plan. I mean, cities have planning departments that are using green standards that um, use conservation in terms of land use. I think there's a definite connection between um, climate change and who it impacts. I mean, over time, um, lower um, income people are usually the most affected by climate change. And so I think there is an interplay between housing uh, there's an interplay between uh, what Ford wants to strip from municipalities who are trying to develop responsibly um, to municipalities that have already developed a strong IZ policy. Um, I think ACORN's position is that we just need to stop this bill and do whatever it takes, whether it's online petitions, protests in the streets, um, in front of ministers' offices. We're already sending letters. Um, we're speaking at consultations. Um, ACORN just wants to oppose this by any means um, essentially necessary, any peaceful means necessary. Thank you so and much. So, oh, sorry, God, you're gonna continue um, talking. There's just a definite connection between environmental impact, um, having rights stripped from um, municipalities. Um, who's gonna fit the bill? Taxpayers are. So I don't think um, Ford has kind of um, explained that. And the land that he's taking and using immigrants as kind of like pointing the finger and blaming the taking of um, environmentally sensitive land and blaming immigrants is just disgraceful. Because Canada is a land of immigrants and we're all immigrants. And so um, I just don't think that that's just in any way. It's just completely discriminatory. So I, I do not agree with him um, stating um, that we need to take the land because we have immigrants coming. Um, we've had immigrants coming to this country for hundreds of years. And so um, I just, 
oppose, I, I'm hoping ACORN, and I'll be working with ACORN to oppose Bill 23 any and every way I can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I know obviously this is, you know, close, close to home for you. And I understand that there's a lot of people that I've talked to who are on living in affordable housing or on, on the verge of living in affordable housing. They're scared. They're really scared because what does this mean for where they're going to be living? Thank you so much for talking from the heart. Thank you. Um, so next we're going to be talking about strategy. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to go into breakout rooms. Um, I have put, I put a poll up and we can select which topics um, you're most concerned about. And then I've also created a breakout room for just talking about overall strategy. So what we're hoping is that people across um, the province who can meet and talk about affordable housing, can meet and talk about loss of protection of uh, wetlands, forest and farmlands and such a sensitive, and what does that mean? Um, that we can talk about loss of power municipalities in the regions and the breakdown of um, like in water the region that could mean the removal of our countryside line um, it could mean that a budgeting cycle is coming up how do we even figure out transit in each of the individual cities to, to create those walkable communities or transit oriented communities because now there's no connected path between the regions and the municipalities in our planning obviously um, civil the loss of civil liberties and the undemocratic way that this bill has been pushed through, just the overarching, um, how quickly it's been pushed through, how quietly it's been pushed through, how many of our values and liberties are being taken away from us by this bill. And then of course, um, overall general loss of green development standards and site control plan. This would be very connected to neighborhood associations um, and communities that, um, really feel that they want to continue building those 15 minute communities and and building the spaces where people can connect um and then overall strategy obviously like i said is what are next steps so i think uh we're still missing about six people um or we're still missing about 10 people to select their options again if you want to pull up the poll go down to the bottom right hand to right hand or bottom of your screen there should be something that says poll um uh, pop that open again only about 30 people have have clicked on their option at least one of the options and i'm going to give another um another few minutes okay so uh, I'm going to end poll now. Okay, I'm going to share the results. And very interesting, a lot interesting. Um, the On Friday, our top concern was affordable housing, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, it was affordable housing, loss protection of wetlands, I think civil liberties in green development standards, I believe, were the three topics. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly put together some rooms. Anyone who doesn't want to talk in a room uh, that actually in the comment box, if you believe there was a topic that you want to talk about that wasn't represented in this poll, or you um, have a, something you maybe want to talk about geographically uh, within your, you know, maybe Hamilton is doing a great job of doing their um their sign waving on the roads any or water the region wants to talk let me know in the chat window if um if you want me to create a breakout room specifically for you guys for those topics okay so um while i create the breakout room it should only take me about two minutes feel free to chat feel free to have a conversation while i'm creating the breakout rooms We got 50 people here. Come on, we're energetic, we're eager, we want to make change. <laughs> Use this I, time to chat. 
I, I could maybe um, I could maybe just convey I had put out some I was trying to do some groundwork on you know what is the best way to respond uh, as I mentioned at the beginning we put out sort of um, with OCEC we tried to sort of mount a campaign to respond and it had a few different facets to it so one being um, you know sign action letters that are already you know have already been organized by others so we amplified the environmental defenses letter but we also encouraged people we gave them the tools to quickly look up their MPP numbers and to call your MPPs, email your MPPs uh, to oppose the bill. And also, um, if you can, when you're calling, request a quick virtual appointment, meet with them, even if it's five minutes and, you know, tell them sort of virtual face to face that you oppose this. Um, also, um, online, you can find um, a submission portal to submit a written submission to oppose the bill directly to the standing committee um, who's responsible for, for hearing uh, feedback on this. And that deadline is November 17th. So that's all in our, in our call to action. What I did as well is I actually checked, um, I put out a question to, uh, um, to some MPPs to say, look, you know, when you guys are getting feedback, what, what is most effective? Is an email more effective than a call? Is a call more effective than, you know, so-and-so? Um, and the feedback I got directly from MP, MPPs is that a call is more effective than an email. Um, and while you're calling, if you can request a quick virtual meeting, even if it's just a few minutes, that has a lot of impact. So, Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we are going to, I opened up the rooms. If anyone has any issues or problems getting into the rooms, uh, please put in the chat window and I'll help move you in. Um, Mac computers and other people um, get into rooms slightly differently. You go to the right you go to the bottom of your screen, it'll say breakout rooms, click on the breakout rooms, you'll be able to see the different topics. And then there's either a join button, or you simply click on the name of the breakout room, and then it moves you in. Um, so we have loss of land protection, loss of power by municipalities, loss, um, loss of, I, yeah, sorry, there's limited text, so loss of green development standards, and then overall, I spelled overall wrong, uh, overall strategy. And again, like I said, if there is a topic or a breakout room that was not created, um, please put it in the chat window and we can create one specifically for you. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned uh, perhaps various task forces to address various issues, rezoning vacant. Mm. Yeah, and I will be sending an email out to everyone. Would be happy to discuss task force or various issues. Um, so Andrea, do you want me to create um so you want me to create a room for called task forces, right? Uh, Millie, I will move you into the room that you want to go into. And I will create a task force one. Um and then I'll let everyone know that that room is available if people want to go into that one. Okay. I think I can. Hmm, maybe I can't. Um, what I might do is I'm going to jump people from the law. Mm, hard. Once these rooms already started. Hmm. Sorry, Andrea, can't do it. If anyone knows how to use Zoom better. Uh, there was no affordable housing when I created because there was only um, one person that selected that. However, I see Tanya's here in this room. So if we wanna utilize this room as an affordable housing room, let's use that. Let's do that, absolutely. Angus, the loss of wetlands um, is land protection, loss of land protection. No, I mean, Angus. still see a lot of people in this room. Does anyone need help moving over? 
And Dan, feel free to talk with uh, Tanya. If anyone who wants to get help moving over, please use the chat window and I'll help you to move over into a room. Um, this is now, I guess, the affordable topic about affordable housing. Yes, how would I join that? This is it, you're in it right now. Well, hello all. Hello, so Tanya and Dan, um, there's other people here I'm sure Ming, assuming would also like to talk about affordable housing. Um, if anyone else, um, yes, if anyone else wants to move to the other rooms, you can let me know, okay? But yeah, go ahead. Uh, if, if I may, um... The notion of uh, the affordability and uh, in the context of the, the premise of this bill being delivering or building housing faster, um, I find that to be disingenuous because uh, the first, first uh, phase impact of this bill is that it's going to be um, getting approvals faster, but not necessarily building housing faster. The idea is that there will be commitments uh, with, with um, uh, designated uh, uh, farmland for, um, for housing, that there would be commitments for infrastructure. And the, the moment that those lands are designated, then basically the, uh, the, the citizens, uh, the taxpayers are on the hook to provide services and to make commitments of other services like water and sewerage. It's the same with um, uh, building permits um, in, uh, in the cities because this really has not made any, um, provide any real direction for alternatives to tall and sprawl as as that saying goes but once a person can um, uh, get a building permit for um, a high-rise building then that's been based upon the calculation of how the um, available utilities are like like water and sewerage so uh, once we're in once those um, two conditions are set and approved, then we, then we are dealing with building, building housing and, and the types of buildings. Um, you know, high rise buildings, they take a long time to build. They, they are intrusive, uh, not only uh, to the uh, physical health of, of the people, but to the economic Help of the of the um, of of the neighborhoods that they're in, or uh, the, the the sectors of the city that they're in. Um, they just it just it's an incredibly expensive process, especially given the technologies that are needed for high rise buildings. Things can be done more quickly at lower scales, and granted, they're going to take more. Um, more land to do that. But the, the notion, uh, if anybody ever says, uh, we have to do high rise because we're running out of land, nobody's making any more land, we're running out of it, that's disingenuous. Uh, on so many levels, even on, the, even on a suburban level, that's disingenuous. So, um, uh, you know there are technologies that are that are being developed that we can actually deliver housing faster. There's modular, and there's and there's um, um, the technologies that are developing are just uh, enabling us to create buildings faster. We don't need to go to um, the the expensive types anymore, although. That is the uh, the expertise that the development industry has at this time. Now, so who would like to start? Um, yeah, who would like to start? Which group? I think the group led by KLG um, should start. Okay, great. And and Joyce, you were the reporter. Are you are you up for doing that? Notes, but I've got three pages of indecipherable notes, so you'll have to bear okay. with me. <laughs> well, and people will have you, to jump you, in with what. Yeah, <laughs> jump in well, with what you can remember. Okay. 
Yeah, well, um, or just tell us where we ended up. Just say where we ended up, which oh, I think was that's, pretty exciting. That's an idea. Yeah, yeah, we ended up by um, by asking the question, can we form a, a, a large coalition of groups um, in order to, um, you know, organize, a, a, you know, at scale? And um, basically, OCEC um, it turns out to be a, the group that is pretty well organized. Um, lots of suggestions as to um, things that we could do. Um, one was an action on the 401 with, um, with getting commuters, um, demonstrations in mm -hmm. various areas like Hamilton and Halton. First Nations could be effective at stopping the bill legally because they have not engaged in the proper um, consultation. Um, another suggestion was get opposition MPPs to repeat their actions um, of calling for a liar and getting kicked out of the house again. Um, but I, all of these ideas, I guess, would be subject to um, um, to submission to the alliance. It was suggested at the at the end of our gathering, which was which was um, you know suggested that OCEC would be the best organization mm -hmm. to pull that together. So um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, on, Peggy. And, yeah, and Millie did t talk about things they had put in place already, but you know we kind of supplemented that with the other ideas that that um, that Joyce mentioned. So I personally think that we don't have time to wait. Um, I, I think that we do need to rely on a bigger organization like um, OCEC if they're willing to to take the lead and then find ways to support them in that in that work. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that we need to necessarily wait for permission to act. And I like I think that I as an individual citizen can contact Laura May Lindo tomorrow and ask her uh, and pitch the idea of having the NDP leaders uh, um, members walk out again in the same way that they did so effectively in support of, of, of the, the education workers. And, um, you know, there are other actions that I'm sure some of us have already committed to that we can just go ahead and take because we've committed on behalf of our, of our local groups to do those kinds of things, like our neighborhood associations, like our, like faith climate justice, like development committees, et cetera. So that's it for me. Fiona, do you wanna say something? I just, I just wanted to say to people who weren't in, um, in the group talking about overall strategies that um, OECE um, has information on Bill 23 already, which they've shared with their, with, with their groups with, and they have an enormous number of groups. And they're going to Millie's agreed to post that on their website so that I'm going out to to, to contact all the groups I've been I, I've been in contact with and get them to sign on as members of this big coalition. Great. Yes, okay. I mean, Are absolutely we... like this, this is bigger than one organization. This is, I mean, yeah. there's like I was saying in the group, it's every single neighborhood association should be reached out to. Every single uh, clean tech business that sh that's investing in net zero housing should be reached out to. Our insurance companies and our banks should be yeah. harassed extremely hard by our citizens and saying that how can you support Bill 23? Make sure you don't support Bill 23 because it's going to lead to massive amount of people having uninsured housing. You're going to be supporting financial, financially, financially supporting developers. They're going to be building these massive sprawl. Um, so one recommendation from a friend of mine was to really approach the funding of these developers and make it extremely difficult and hard and show that to these developers, this is not going to be an easy win for you because you will not get funding from the bank because the banks have said, I mean, that's going to take a longer time frame, but, you know, we really need to be getting down to the little bits and pieces every single civil organization and group across ontario should be made aware of how this impacts them and rallying around it go ahead marley 
Um, are the conservation authorities speaking up against this at all? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Environmental Defense has come up with a huge letter signing, they come up with press releases. Absolutely. The conservation authorities themselves have, have spoken up about this as well. Um, but I mean, it's just like municipalities, they walk a fine line between they don't really, they can't really necessarily um, piss the Ford government off by blatantly saying certain things because they have to work very closely with them. So some municipalities are going to say, you know, be a lot more forward and some might feel more cautious, right? I think we've got another hand up. Jay, would you like to say something? Jay, you're muted. Jay, you're still muted. However, in the comments, you asked about crafting a letter for us to use. There's already a number of letters that have already been crafted. If you go to the open source document or uh, Google, Google folder, in there is a spreadsheet. And in there, it actually gives a list of different press releases that have been released, different articles that have been generated by, say, Environmental Defense, as well as there's a tab there, it says letter writing. If you click on that, there's at least four or five organizations that have created letters that you can click on each of those and sign the letters. Um, after these events are done, now that I have more time, I'm going to be working on clipping the send, videos and then also- Send an original more, letter. Like, Don't just, just copy an, an existing mm -hmm. one. It Pardon? doesn't count as original then in the eyes of the, of the provincial like government. Greg? Send an original letter. Use, use a one as a, as a model perhaps, but don't just copy that letter and stick your, your own name under it and nail it into the premier. They'll, they'll see, oh, these are all, all the same thing. Mm. The meaning is greatly no. reduced if you do that. No, I disagree. Yeah. Plus, Roger, I, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry Roger. Roger. Yeah, I, had a, I had a question um, and it's something that's puzzled me over this issue and a number of others. Um, I'm in a writing that has an NDP um, MLA, uh, MPP. Um, so if I phone them up, basically, I'm just wasting their office time because they've got stuff to do. They're on site already. Um, if, I, if however I phone a Tory MPP down in Cambridge and I'm asked, where do you live? And I say, I'm in Kitchener. They'll say, go find your own MP, you know? How do we get through to those Tory MPs if we're not in the writing? Contact the minister. Yes. Yeah, I, I do that all the time, but uh, you know, you get a sense of deafness there. Um, local MPs might be a little more sensitive. Well, you could always write them a personal note and try and connect yourself to them somehow, establish a relationship with them. Like, I really liked what you said about this, but you know, this, or, you know, I don't know, mm. be creative. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here um, as somebody who's been very involved in my local writing NDP for 30 years uh, know, uh, knows my um, NDP MPP. I shall tell you they need all the support they can get um, right now when, um, uh, for instance, so my MPP, Jeff Birch, has put forward a private member's bill um, calling for the Ontario government to do far more to um, for people, um, very vulnerable people in, um, um, in, in terms of their housing. Um, they really want, they need to know that a lot of us are out here behind them if, so that they can stand up and make a noise in the legislature. And can I, I think I'm next. So I'm wondering if I can just be assured that um, the Ontario Coalition for, um, uh, the Ontario Climate Emergency Coalition, sorry, I'm still struggling with that name, um, <laughs> is, going to take, is going to take this on and that we will all be contacted so that we can be involved beyond the individual actions that we're going to take. 
So everyone here in, in this event uh, is will be contacted by 50 by 30 again. I'll touch okay. base with Millie to ensure next steps. Okay. I'm assuming she can't necessarily speak with, about the whole organization. No. But um, we will work forward with that. And I do think, though, that there, there needs to be an opportunity um, that might be far past what Millie's organization and group can, can do to ensure that there's still a diverse amount of actions that people can individually take within their localized communities. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Angus. Um, hi. Um, Steph, is that correct? Yeah. Steph, I believe earlier um, mentioned something about insurance. And I think that is something that will get the intention, the attention of this particular party, this particular government. There is a group at the University of Waterloo, probably several of you know about them. Um, I don't have the right name now, but they are concerned with climate change. And one of the key parts is what natural heritage features can do in managing water quantity, such as flood control. They're doing an awful lot of work with it. I've forgotten the proper name of it right now but they may already be involved in this. I expect they certainly know about it and they may be a key ally as other components of the insurance industry, getting insurance or not getting insurance or people not being able to get insurance in these areas. I don't know how to go about that, uh, but that's a place to tap, I believe. Madeline, you can go ahead. You can just speak. Madeline, yes. Go ahead. Uh, the go Insurance ahead. Bureau of Canada was established uh, as a direct result of uh, the flooding from Hurricane Hazel, with the loss of eighty-one lives and uh, with the most uh, severe financial and and property da damage in Canadian history until the floods out west last year. Uh, the Insurance Bureau of Canada would probably be very supportive of what you're talking about. Uh, it's just a matter of getting in touch with them. Uh, we had one of their spokespersons uh, talking about uh, insurance and flood loss. Uh, on the anniversary of Hurricane Hazel about, um, about five or six years ago. Uh, I guess that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's 8.49. Um, next steps. I mean, obviously this meeting uh, was again about information gathering. It was about seeing who was out there, who could mobilize. Obviously, um, OCEC has has offered the, the about the potential um, opportunity to work with them to mobilize um, across the province under um, uh, a common objective for all areas. Um, I think that's that's great. Um, oh, was there just the one breakout room? Oh, we had breakout rooms. Thank you. Ha ha. Thank you, Kay. Other breakout rooms. Other topics. Let's hear from you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Tell me, let's hear it. What about land protection? Who's the people from that were doing land protection? Well, we yes, were Gwen. in the land protection, but we talked about many, uh, so much else, and uh, also wished, uh, sought a coalition approach to bring, we calculated roughly hundreds of organizations that must be, uh, must be uh, engaged, will, would, should be engaged with this, will be when they know more, one would figure. So uh, a, a lot more press coverage, publicity, attention, spreading the word would be important. Um, momentarily, or as in passing by, mentioned social media, although uh, 
I don't think any one of us actually wanted to tackle that, but social media is, seems to be the way these days. Um, and but we opened and with uh, Madeline's remarks on the Hurricane Hazel, and and then we almost closed with Anna L Louise's remarks on the flooding in York uh, Southeast. Is that what it was? Southwest. Anyway, that is Michael Ford's writing. What a collapse. So here, Hurricane Hazel led to, contributed towards uh, better uh, work, work by the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority. And I guess we pretty well thought they did a good job, but then compare that to what is happening in the York Southeast. Now, this doesn't actually lead to a suggestion but it is um, uh, a, a context that may be uh, relevant. Uh, mostly, uh, we all hoped to embarrass Doug Ford to such a degree that he would back off from this. So what ways can we, what can we adopt to, uh, to uh, embarrass him? He's, uh, he does not like, well, he doesn't like his uh, reputation um, in tatters. And so maybe we'll find a way. If anybody's got any anything on them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think um, like the land protection, it's how do we reach every single group that has already been fighting the last you know decade in protecting their land and ensuring that the language that we're using reaches their audience and they fully understand the threat to the potential threat to what they've been doing um and how do we do that merely through OCEC or how do we who's going to be coordinating reaching out to every single and how do you even find them and there are websites for stop sprawl and protecting farmland and aggregate pits but you know, for smaller, smaller groups that in more rural areas, there might not be huge media announcements or websites on the on the groups that have been trying to protect um, within their municipal boundaries, right? There are the land cons, uh, conservancy uh, organizations, of which there are several, and then there's Olita, which is the coordinating one. So that would be one uh, uh, which was probably already organizing something, but they they would have more leads themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Fiona? Um, just wanted to say, I'm, so, I'm sorry, um, I'm, I'm sure it can come by um, in one of these meetings, but um, um, the uh, agricultural community, um, we should- The Ontario Federation of Agriculture, as well as the- Yeah, but, sm ones. but smaller organizations, smaller organizations as well. Um, has the NFU said anything about it yet? National Farmers Union. I have not. I Mark Russer just presented. He's the president, uh, vice president, I believe, of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. He just presented in front of um, the Water of the Region Council regarding Bill 23, and there's definitely an uproar. But we do need to make sure that you know. Again, there's a lot of people saying we don't like it. We don't like it. But how how do we amp help them amplify their voice to make sure that they're their their voices have a lot larger presence we almost need like i think someone was mentioning social media social media that might have been andrea but you know ha having a hundred <laughs> people out there that literally are following the hashtags yeah I'm gonna hashtag take. bill 23 that's what i do every single night before i go to bed i search bill 23 and just reshare all the yeah. posts i can um but you know it's about how do we create a big enough noise about every single group that's saying something about this right Okay, um, affordable housing group. I believe um, Tanya has left. Barb, you were there in the meeting, right? Yeah, yes, I can share, um, unless someone else would like to share. No, okay, I will. Um, we we uh, heard a lot more from Tanya about uh, the uh, concerns about the affordable housing and um, uh, 
we concluded that we think there's going to be a lot more homeless people. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of uh, trying to mobilize people around this issue, we thought maybe the fact that um, municipalities will no longer get the develop developer uh, charges and it's going to result in um, inability for municipalities to actually support uh, uh, affordable housing in their areas and all of the other infrastructures that are needed for um, housing developments, um, including libraries and schools and pools and other parks and so on. Uh, and that's going to fall on the taxpayer. So we, we were thinking that we need to raise the issue of the financial impact on people with their taxes. I mean, that seems to hit people in a very um, important place, their pocketbook. Um, and then we were reminded about the importance of getting the media on board. We haven't heard too much about this. And uh, we think we need to uh, get in touch with our local papers. Um, I guess op-eds or letters to the editor, um, trying to make sure that it gets some coverage and, and our neighborhoods, our local papers, our neighborhoods are, are reading about it. So um, I think if someone else is from the group and wants to add more, I'd appreciate it. Hmm. Okay, uh, and what was the last group? There was one for green development standards, but I think that was pretty municipal small. Power. Oh, municipal, oh, there's two. Um, the loss of municipal power. Yeah, so we had a little bit of a mix up in our note taking. So here's just a few of the highlights that others have not covered already. Um, emphasis on on bringing it local and showing how for for local people what this legislation would do to them in terms of water and green space and stuff like that um putting a lot of a spotlight on that this is kind of anti-democratic and autocratic that came up in terms of groups that were missing or individuals that were missing we wished we had a lawyer in the group so that we could actually understand what was going on another thing that came up was to figure out which commercial interests will actually lose from this legislation. There was some thinking that big developers will win, but will there be smaller developers that lose and can we find them and identify them? Um, I would add uh, another thing that didn't directly come up in the group, but another group that seems to be missing here is millennials. A lot of this legislation is around building more homes so that millennials can have their first home. But if millennials don't like this legislation, then that might have something. Uh, uh, be a talking point. And then there was also some talk about um, rural urban divides. And uh, one of our members was from Ottawa and said that that's been really emphasized in that city council um, to think about how there can be more allyship over that rather than divides over the urban rural split. And I may have missed some important things. So other members of our group can pitch in with the most important things if for the stuff that I've missed. I can't remember, uh, Paul, if this was in our discussion. Um, oh no, it might've been in the larger one about, about um, contacting neighborhood associations, et cetera. So I think that was part of the bigger uh, discussion, but that was our, our focus too, was neighborhoods, getting neighborhoods to understand how this impacts them. If you're looking at the big picture, people get lost and they kind of glaze over, um, but bring it home to how your home and your kids and your family are impacted is really key. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And if you have, if there's someone that wants to write that content or come up with some of that content, you can drop that in the open source document. I'm sure there's other people that would like to help populate some of these, some of these documents together. I find it's very easy when I'm emailing or tweeting um, neighborhood associations or Facebook messaging neighborhood associations If I can just go in a document, which I've already started creating and I see, okay, this bill talks to this group in this way and it relates to them in this way. 
simply just copying and pasting that and then dropping in the Facebook message or in the tweet message or to it or on tweet um, or in the email, it makes things go so much faster when I'm trying to reach as many people as possible. I mean, Barb and I probably reached um, thousands of people over the last week trying to get them to come to these events to listen and better understand what Bill 23 is. And it's, you know, you also then recognize how many more people you need to reach because <laughs> you're still seeing the environmental people. You're still seeing the people that are part of, you know, this closer knit bubble. Um, and uh, yeah, like every single council needs to be. So anyways, uh, so next steps, I think that's all the groups, correct? Okay, next steps, it's nine o'clock. Um, the recording should be up in the next day or two. I'm trying to get to bed before midnight or one o'clock in the morning, so I might not do it tonight. Um, but then again, I, I like getting things done. Um, so uh, I might stay up tonight, but um, the YouTube videos will be up. I'm trying to make smaller clips. Please share the smaller clips that are more informative. There's the open source document. Uh, if you would like to add any content or add any spreadsheets or or add any links or anything, please email me. I'll give you access to the shared document and you can start populating yourselves. We'll try to get that information out there to the general group of people. Um, I'll talk with OCEC. Um, Barb and I were already talking with the Labor Council. We're already talking with um, Environmental Defense. We're already talking with um, different MPPs. Um, yeah, we're, yeah, Ontario Health Coalition. There's already groups that we're, we're tapping into um, that we're hoping to pull together um, in a coordinated way. Like I said, 50 by 30 probably needs to step back from this a bit more to stay hyper-focused on water in the region because our official plan is probably going to come back next a bit or it's going to be improved, but it's probably going to um, going to destroy some of our um, agricultural lands. So we need to rally our water in the region uh, community regarding that. Um, but yeah, so there is next steps. Do not feel that 50 by 30 or OCEC is taking leadership. Therefore, you don't necessarily need to do something or take action. Again, this is all on all of us individually to take action. I'm sure I'm, su I'm assuming OCEC would love to maybe build their volunteer base. Um, so potentially the list that we're building uh, for that spreadsheet of people who want to build something across the province. Um, when you sign that form, it says that you're open to this information being shared with another organization that wants to mobilize across the province. So your information just may be shifted over to their organization or a different group. Um, again, if you want to talk strategy, reach out to us. Um, but yeah, does anyone want to say anything? Okay. I love ideas. I love brainstorming ideas. Feel free. My email is, you know, my email, you can reach me at 50 by 30. Um, if I respond, my phone number is in there. So you can give me a call at any time. I love brainstorming ideas and the way I'm doing things or the way we have been doing things is not the way that it has to be done in the future or whatever. We can always shift and adapt. Okay. Great. Uh, Steph. Yes. Uh, can I can I just add one thing? I was talking about the University of Waterloo before mm -hmm. and insurance. And actually, I found the name of what I was talking about. The Intact Center on Climate Adaptation. You probably know it. Yes. yes. Uh, but I think they would likely be big ally in terms of uh, controlling water quantity. Yes. So I've already been talking with professors at the University of Waterloo. There's a lot of academics that are really no, like really concerned about all this stuff, but they have no clue how to mobilize. They don't know how to get their word out there. They are just passionate people that have this research and knowledge and they want to create action, but they need help from the community to mobilize them. Yes. Uh, also, the fellow that's the head of that Intact Center, I'm missing his name right now. Mm -hmm. He is uh, in the media quite a lot talking about controlling flooding in, yes. in a variety of landscapes, municipal particularly, but also to a degree rural. Um, he is media savvy. Blair yes, Feltmate. Just, pardon? Blair Feltmate is the, uh, Dr. Blair Feltmate is the head of the Intact Center. Hi, Angus. Yes. And yes. Uh, you're right. I mean, he is on the media all the time. He's very strategic. And this poses huge risks to the insurance industry, there are and the way they're doing this, it's a huge loss 
in terms of uh, setting up failures of, of putting housing in areas where they're prone to be floods. So at a time when we're experiencing much greater uh, risk from extreme storm events, much greater flood events, and as well as extreme heat events, we are actually setting ourselves up for major failure and we will have communities where they will no longer even be insured. And it's the intact, the intact insurance which supports the intact center for, for climate adaptation. So I think they would be all over this. And I think we need to find ways by which we can show this is a, a, a loss, our, our losing proposition on many fronts. Instead of having safe communities, we are greatly increasing their, their liability for, for flood damage. And uh, that will bite both the government as well as the insurance industry. But we need time to mobilize. And I think that is the big issue. And yeah, so I actually I actually interviewed Blair on Friday. He couldn't come to the Friday night at meeting. So I, I got him to come up with a bunch of quotes um, that I still have his video. I got a clip and put it on YouTube. Um, but he talks about how there's 10 million homes in Ontario alone that cannot get insurance because of basement flooding, that there's a $43,000 average for when basements flood and only insurance covers 20,000 of it. So I got these really cool snippets of quotes. So if you know anyone else has these cool quotes, I'd love to be able to take, you know, the 30 second quotes and get them on YouTube um, to help share them, right? And you may want to talk to him about natural infrastructure because he's a great ally on that. We need to yes. be protecting and restoring more wetlands and more forests. And in fact, we're going in the exact opposite direction, increasing yes. risk of floods, et cetera. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you watch the video for Gabby from Clean Air Partnerships, um, yeah, she goes into that a bit more um, about the flooding and just laughing how, you know, they, she didn't specifically say it, but like it's God mentality that somehow you think you can just pump out a wetland and it'll be fine <laughs> and it won't flood again. <laughs> um, but anyways, go ahead, Madeline, and then we're going to wrap things up. Well, Unless people want to stay for um, a quote, Madeline did an amazing testimonial on Friday night. We got a video of that. Again, I need to find time to make that into a good clip. Um, but it was a great, great um, touching story, emotional story of her personal um, life. Anyways, go ahead, Madeline. What was the reason for the flooding in the museum uh, subway station yesterday so that it had to be closed? I, you know, I know that there is flooding mm -hmm. in, in that basement flooding in that area periodically from underground streams. I don't know whether that mm -hmm. had anything to do with it or it was uh, one of the other misfortunes that, that happens to the TTC. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry about that. Okay, so again, I, I want to make, thank you, Madeline. It, okay. Go ahead. No, you can raise that issue. I mean, I, I think it's important that it, the flooding is impactful to not just people live in floodplains. I think we hear that a lot, mm -hmm. even in Wilmot Township. Oh, you can't complain about your basement flooding because you're in a floodplain. You're like, mm. <laughs> but their floodplains are expanding. <laughs> but anyways, Roger. Yeah, what, one of the key factors here um, that's relevant to this bill is when you let people build on floodplains, uh, it, there's research on this and it, it's known that when you get subsequent flooding events, the water can't get through because of the development. And then the actual flood area, the flood zone is increased in height upstream from that area. So some of the people who might be most incensed about this would be people who live on the edge of floodplains because they are going to get dunked uh, because of development downstream. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I don't, I hate to kick people off when we're all still here and eager to keep talking, but I do think that it's nine o'clock. <laughs> now, 50 by 30, water of the region, we don't have another meeting set up. There is nothing set up with, with building this or momentum or doing things other than that open source document and the email list that we have. Now, the, through Eventbrite, I can only technically through their legality things. I can only email you about the event that just happened, such as a Zoom recording or something like that. After that, it's not a mailing list. I can't just use that as a open source mailing list to mail email you about anything. Uh, so we do need a mailing list to utilize. People have been joining 50 by 30 um, mailing list to stay up to date. But again, that's probably not the best 
location to join mailing lists. So Millie, I think, dropped in um, her information in the website to join their mailing list. But again, um, if, if because I feel bad about breaking the rules of Eventbrite, what I probably will end up doing is uh, individually emailing batches of people um, who registered for these events and trying to get them engaged in some way. Um, but yeah, as next steps. But email me, you have my email. Can you give us permission? Uh, yeah, when I email you again, you can have my, you can tell me your permission. <laughs> Stephanie, great stuff. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. If you registered, I have your email list or email address. Yeah, thank you, Seth. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys. Or girls, ladies, whoever, they, them. We don't do the, we didn't do the gender pronouns. Sorry about that. Great. Thanks so much. Yes, if you register for the Zoom link in the event, right, I have your email address. Angus, do you have anything to say? Or Gwen, are you are you looking to figure out a way to get out? How do you get uh, out of this meeting? <laughs> really, really, it was. I'll just make I'll just make a quick comment. 